Are you going to vote in the next European elections? We asked people on the streets of London if they were planning to take part. These are their answers. I don't know anything about them, I'm afraid. I think it's important to vote. I don't know who I'm going to vote for yet. No, tell me, I don't vote or anything, seriously. If you don't vote, you can't complain about what's happened, can you? So you have to vote. I think they're important for United Kingdom. Gives us a choice. I'll probably vote, but I'll vote to come out of Europe. According to some surveys, these elections could have the lowest turnout in the Parliament's history. So what's gone wrong? At Université Libre of Brussels, some students, our future politicians, give us some clues. The message that comes to the citizen passes through the national political class, and in my opinion, that's where the problem is. In the school, I never had one lesson about Europe, how it works. And the opinions of two non-European students. We're talking about economic crisis, probably they are they don't know what to expect from the European Union. We need to change the image of Europe to make it more sexy, to make it more attractive to young people. Many European citizens don't know the powers and responsibilities of the European Parliament have gradually increased during the last 30 years. For example, it blocked plans for the 27 member states to extend the working week to 65 hours. We're going to analyse the progressive lack of interest of the Europeans in the EU over three decades of European electoral history. The first European elections by direct universal suffrage. Citizens from the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Ireland and Denmark chose their MEPs for the first time. Then there were 410 MEPs in the European Parliament. The turnout almost 62%, the highest in the history of the European elections. In the United Kingdom, only 32% of British voters went to the ballot boxes. Was this the first sign of the nation's traditional Euroscepticism? They don't fully appreciate and fully understand A, the history which created the European Parliament, and B, the development of it, and it's all surrounded by money. How much does it cost? What do we get out of it? Instead of, isn't it worthwhile to avoid the sort of things that I went through in the 40s when we were firing bullets at each other? In these first elections, the Socialist Party won more votes than the Conservatives. The Communist Party, the Liberals and the British Conservatives shared the remaining seats. In 1981, Greece was the 10th member to enter the European Une Union. Nous Elections 1984, the European Socialist Party increases the advantage over the Conservatives. Turnout falls to 59%. In 1986, Spain and Portugal, the newest members of the EU. In 1989, the third European elections, 11 political groups share more than 500 MEPs. The socialist bloc continues to be the major force in the parliament, the turnout 58%. Socialist Enrique Baron Crespo, the first of three Spanish presidents of the European Parliament. You can criticise the fact that people don't vote. However, in a democracy, it's a citizen's right not to fulfil a civic obligation. Normally, systems in which 99.9% .9 of the population vote, or more than 100%, are the dictatorships. 1994, the fourth European Parliament elections, and there is less distance between socialists and conservatives. The turnout, lower than 56%. 1995, Austria, Finland and Sweden are the new members of the EU. 1999, the fifth European elections, the vote shifts to the right for the first time, a trend which has continued until the present day. Enthusiasm doesn't come to order. It has to be built, because we have to have a strong political project to propose to the European citizens, especially to the young. Unfortunately, I think it will be difficult to convey the message. The Irish Liberal Party's Pat Cox follows Fontaine as a president of the European Parliament until 2004. Too often the election is a mid-term test of a regional or a national government. Too often the European election is a kind of a dogfight between personalities. But in fact, there are so many European issues. May the 1st, 2004, was the day the EU grew even bigger when the 15 became 25. The European Popular Party continues to be the major force in the Parliament. Turnout fell to 45%. In some new member states, turnout is lower than 30%. Mama.
Spanish socialist Joseph Borrell is elected as the new president of the European Parliament. We have to deal with why. As we get more important, we mean less to the voters. This reflects a certain wariness in the process of the construction of Europe. We'll have to try to reverse this, because if not, if the people aren't enthusiastic, it won't be possible to build a new Europe. 2007, Romania and Bulgaria, new members of the EU. The 27 are now almost 500 million people. Summing up, in this graphic we can see the negative evolution of the turnout in the European elections from 62% in 1979 to 45% in 2004. Simon Hicks, a political scientist and teacher at the London School of Economics, has created, with two other experts, a study of probable votes for the coming elections. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes below 40% this time. So this is sort of historic low turnouts. We've seen declining turnout in national elections and we're seeing declining turnout in European elections. Europeans are just not mobilised or motivated by politics. There's no sort of Obama figure in Europe. Mario Tello, president of the Institute for European Studies in Brussels, says there are many reasons for this lack of interest in European elections. Information about the activity of the European Parliament is not given to the citizens, although this institution decides on important matters, such as health, the environment and the social and economic crisis. Two British former Brussels correspondents tell us what they think. It's true the media interest in the European Parliament has dwindled, but the European Parliament doesn't make it easy for itself. You know, it's hugely expensive for a journalist and a newspaper or a news organisation to cover a Parliament which sits in two separate buildings. Nick Watts talks about the differences between French and English media on European issues. And 80% of the British media basically trash the European Union. They have lies, they distort what goes on. And on the other side you have the French media, which I think is a little too deferential. If a French journalist goes and interviews a European commissioner, they'll sit there, they'll interview them, and then they'll do a transcript, question-answer, question-answer of what they said in their answers, and they'll send that transcript to the European politician for them to approve. In the EU, we don't have Obama, but the European Parliament is making an effort to urge people to vote. This is the official thrust of the campaign. Different countries use different strategies. In Germany, for instance, legendary goalkeeper Oliver Kahn is heading the campaign to ensure people cast their votes with the slogan, You can choose tomorrow's news.